Heavenly Father, we understand these are difficult times, these are strange times, and we recognize that we are seeing times that uh, Jesus told us about, particularly in uh, the Gospels, that we should expect these things to happen. And I pray that you will help us to strengthen our faith in you, Lord, that you will give us the gift of strong faith, that we might be able to continue to rely on you as we did before, that we might know that your grace and your love and your comfort continues with us each and every day. I pray, Lord, that as we open our Bibles this morning and we explore the woman who was healed with the touch of faith, that your Holy Spirit will inspire us with the truth that we too can experience the joy and the peace and the presence of Jesus through that very same touch of faith. Lord, this morning, my, my words that I preach be your words and not my own, is my prayer in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Friends, I want to start with a, a story this morning. It's entitled The Tightrope Walker. And there was a gentleman who was very, very talented at walking tightropes. And he was uh, quite famous in Europe during the uh, the early parts of the uh, 18th and, and uh, sorry the early parts of the 19th century, and he would be walk going all over Europe. And I no doubt you've seen and heard stories about this in the past of men who would stretch out these very tight wires between these buildings, and they would walk along those wires, and uh, they had the wind blowing, and they'd have that long pole hanging out. And this man was particularly talented at doing this and he would travel from place to place in Europe and he would have this long pole and not only would he walk the tightrope, he would even walk it blindfolded and say so he was very talented and very clever and news got around and there was a promoter in the United States of America who had heard about this gentleman who did these marvellous feats but he hadn't actually seen it because we need to remember that this was back in the days before television and before radio. So he sent a message to this gentleman in, the, in Europe and he said, look, I'd like you to come over to the United States and we're gonna string a wire across Niagara Falls and I would like to promote an event where you are going to come and walk this tightrope. He said to him, I have seen and I have heard, I've heard all about what you are actually doing but I haven't actually seen it and I don't really believe that you can do it. But look, come over anyway and we'll have our promotion and we'll see what we can do in order to allow people to see you do these marvellous things that people say that you can do. And so when the gentleman received this letter, he said, yes, I'd love to do that. I will come over. And so they set the date and uh, this man paid, the promoter paid for the expenses of this gentleman to come over to Europe and to do this special trick. Now, what they did was they strung up a wire between the American side and the Canadian side of the border. Because as you know, that uh, river where Niagara Falls is divides Canada and America. And so the, the promoter stood on the American side and this gentleman, he actually got out and not only did he walk the rope, not only did he successfully make it across that rope with a blindfold, but he was also pushing a wheelbarrow. And he pushed a wheelbarrow and when he got across to the other side, he said to the promoter, did you see that? Let me read this to you. He said to the promoter, well, Mr. Promoter, now do you believe that I can do this? And the promoter said, well, of course I do. I mean, I just saw you do it. No, he said, do you really believe that I can do this? And the promoter said, well, of course I do. I just saw you with my own eyes. You just did it. No, 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 he said again. Do you believe that I can do this? Yes, said the promoter. I believe that you can do it. And so the gentleman's typewriter said, okay, I'm going to go back again, and this time I want you to get into the wheelbarrow. Now, the Greek word believe means to live by. To live by. And this nice little story now, this is the lovely story, but it makes us ask the question, we can say that we believe, but are we willing to live by what we believe? When Christ comes to us and says, do you believe in me? Would we be willing to get into that wheelbarrow? That's a very good question, isn't it? Friends, today I'd like to share a story from the Bible that reveals faith, hope, healing, 
and victory, and it's all tied up with Jesus right at the centre. I want you to open your Bibles with me this morning. I hope you've got your Bibles with you. Every time I'm preaching, I want you to make sure that you have the sword of the Lord in your hands. And I'm going to open up to the book of Mark, and I'm going to read verses 25 to 34, and then we're going to have a little investigation of these verses. So Mark 25, uh, sorry, Mark chapter 5, verses 25 through to 34. And these are the words that I'm going to read as soon as I put my glasses on. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from the physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better. Rather, she was growing worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. What a wonderful story that is, friends. The story of faith made whole. Verses 25 and 26 of this story reveal to us that this woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. 12 whole years. That's 144 months. That's 4,380 days. That's 105, 120 hours. 105,000 hours of this condition that was causing her so much pain, so much humiliation, and so much embarrassment. Let's have a look. Just quickly, keep your finger in Mark chapter 5, but I want you to turn over with me to Leviticus chapter 15 because there is a significant verse here that the Hebrews were living by, and we need to have a look at this verse to understand the situation that this woman found herself in. Leviticus chapter 15 and verse 25, and I read these words, if a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, other than at the time of her customary impurity, or if it runs beyond her usual time of impurity, all of the days of her unclean discharge shall be as the days of her customary impurity. And then these words at the end, which were significant to this woman, she shall be unclean. Unclean. We've heard those words before, haven't we? Unclean. Unclean means that she was treated just like a leper, although she wasn't contagious but it also meant she had a very limited life quality. Friends, I imagine that at the moment we can kind of identify with what this woman was having to go through because she was having to socially distance herself from those around her. She had no friends. She couldn't be a wife. She couldn't be a mother. She couldn't lead a normal life. We can only imagine the pain that this woman was going through, most probably in the flower of her youth, when she should have been married, when she should have been bearing children, where she should have had a family around her and having her normal connections with other people. But she was an outcast. She was unclean. She couldn't answer the normal impulses that any woman would have in her life in wanting to be a mother and have children. Quite possibly, she may not have lived much longer with the condition that she had because death was quite possibly approaching her. She was living in a state of what we would call today desperation. She was desperate. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we read, uh, let me reread for you verses 27 and 28 in Mark chapter 5. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. 
for she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I will be made well. Now, this text does not reveal anything to us about this woman's knowledge of Jesus. It doesn't tell us anything about what she knew about Christ. But you might remember when we were talking a couple of weeks ago about the thief on the cross, that the way that the word got around the community about how Christ was going about healing people was something that was being spoken of quite clearly mouth mouth to mouth in a very efficient grape, grapevine because remember they didn't have newspapers or social media they didn't have zoom that they could connect to each other and so we find that this woman's knowledge of jesus was most likely very similar to all the other persons including the thief on the cross where they would have heard about how he had healed the blind she would have heard about how he would have um, healed the, uh, the, the one that couldn't see and indeed how he even had raised the dead. She must have heard all the stories and all the testimonies regarding Jesus' power to heal. She realised that Jesus was passing nearby and hope sprung up in her heart because we remember that the Bible tells us she had spent all her means on these uh, on these physicians of the day, and in ver indeed in verse 26 it said, and had suffered many things. We can only imagine what these physicians would have been requiring her to do in order to uh, help her overcome this affliction because the physicians of the day were not nearly as uh, advanced as they are today. She was at the end of her rope, but then she, she heard that Jesus was passing by very closely and hope had sprung up in her heart. And as her knowledge of Jesus, and as she was hearing the testimonies and listening to what people were saying, hope began and faith began to spring up in her life and she began to believe. And her friends and her neighbours' testimony inspired her faith in her heart. So without the knowledge of personal testimony, she would have not believed. Friends, there is a lesson here for us. Sometimes a word, sometimes a short story, sometimes just a sentence into the ear of an unbeliever can spring up faith in their heart later on when they become desperate. So don't be afraid. If you bump into someone in the street or if you're talking to a neighbour on the telephone, particularly at the moment, don't be afraid to say, praise God for the rain. Praise God for the flowers. Praise God for the trees. Praise God that he has given me the joy and the peace in my life that I need in order to get through these difficult times because that personal testimony may be someone that can help someone else at some point to come to know Jesus just as this woman had begun to believe in Jesus through hearing the personal testimony of others around about her. She believed that if she could get close enough, if she could just get close enough and touch his clothes, that she might be made well. This was the hope in her heart, that she might be able to regain the hope of motherhood and family and friendship. So it was a desperate situation that she was in. Now, there was uh, a situation that there was a supernatural tradition going on at the time, that supernatural power extended into one's clothing. And we see some uh, examples of this at times in the book of Acts when if uh, Paul touched a handkerchief and handed it to someone, they could run off who was to someone who was sick and give them the handkerchief and they would be healed. Or there are also instances in the book of Acts where Paul's or the disciples' shadow fell on people and they were healed. So there was some supernatural type of beliefs starting to surround these things. But as we are going to see, it is faith that heals, not physical implements. And it is not even the faith, it is the faith in the one that we believe in that can produces the healing. In verse 27, we read these words. And when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. She came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Now consider this. She was a social outcast. She shouldn't have been in the crowd at all. By the law of Leviticus, she was unclean. She should have not been there. In fact, she should have been calling out, unclean, unclean, to warn people to keep away. She was desperate 
and wanted nothing more than to experience healing from the healer. Her desperation sharpened her focus and she knew what she had to do and she was not going to be turned aside by doing, by, from doing it. Now, some versions of scripture say she not only touched his garment, but she touched the hem of his garment. Now, we all know, well, those who particularly are seamstresses will also know that the hem of, the, of a person's garment actually exists right around the bottom of where they work. So she, uh, of, where they, of where their garment finishes, down the bottom. So she must have been close to the ground. She may have even been on her hands and knees coming up behind Jesus as he was being thronged by the crowds in the last desperate act. She was just trying to reach out her hand just to brush his clothes. She felt that the entire entirety of her life of faith was being focused on that moment when she could just reach out and brush the bottom of the hem of his garment. And as she came near amidst the thronging crowd, it appeared that Jesus was going to get away. It appeared to her that he was about to pass by. So she threw herself forward. She threw herself on the ground and reached out and stretched out as far as she could. And in one last desperate effort, just the tips of her fingers grazed his hem. But that was enough, the lightest touch. But she had achieved what she was trying to achieve. She was achieving the touch of faith. And at that moment, immediately, and I want to read to you verse 29. What happened at that moment? Immediately, the fountain of her blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Now, it's interesting that they should use this word immediately because when God creates a miracle, it doesn't wait. Sometimes it can happen immediately. And she knew, she perceived in her body that this fountain of blood had dried up. Now, I want to share with you a short experience that I had in my younger years, in my 30s, all those years ago. I used to experience migraine headaches. And I remember one time I had a headache that was so blindingly bad that I had to go to the hospital. Unfortunately, I was working for the Sydney Adventist Hospital at the time. And so I dragged myself up to the hospital and I said, I've got a headache that is so bad, I can't turn my head, I can't turn my neck, I can't open my eyes because my eyes are light sensitive. The pain is just exquisite. I, I need, I, I must have something. And so the doctor very kindly laid me back in a chair and he gave me a needle of what they call pethidine. And as I laid back in that chair and I closed my eyes and I just felt this headache draining out of the back of my head, and I thanked God for the sweet release that I had from the pain that had been hammering at my head for the last 24 hours. And I can, I can just imagine how this woman felt after 12 years of having this blood flow coming out from her, holding her back from leading a normal life, that finally she was released. And I can understand how she felt because when I was released from the pain of this migraine headache, it was just such the sweetest feeling. It was like nothing else I'd ever, ever happened. It happened to me nearly 30 years ago and I still remember today. So I have a little bit of an affinity and I'm sure there might be people out there who can understand the same thing, this release from pain, that what this woman must have been feeling at the touch of the hem of her garment. But not only did she have the release from pain, she had the healing that came with it. She was made whole again. Now, it's interesting that the language that Mark uses in this story is an instant and continuous action. So the healing, according to the language of the original Greek, was immediate and permanent. It was never going to go back to the way it was before. She was restored. She was made whole. You could almost say she was recreated as a new person. And not only physically, but I imagine also spiritually, because her faith had been proven true to her own life. And now she had a wonderful testimony to share with other people about what Jesus had done for her. But an amazing thing, an interesting thing happens now. We look at verse 30 and we see that Jesus, I'm reading from verse 30, Mark chapter 5 and verse 30. 
And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? That's interesting, isn't it? Jesus stops in his tracks and he turns around and said, who touched me? Who touched me? Now, in the very next verse, in verse 31, we read this. But the disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? Because we can imagine that Jesus was being jostled in this crowd and he would have been pushed to the left and pushed to the right. And as he was walking along, he was trying to make his way through the crowd who were all trying to clamor towards him. And all of a sudden, according to the disciples, he just stops in the middle of it and turns around and says, who touched me? And the disciples are thinking, there's people pushing you left, right and centre. What are you asking who touched you for? There are people touching you all the time. The disciples were displaying a little bit of sarcasm, I think, saying, what are you talking about? What do you mean who touched you? This miracle is unique in that it's an accidental miracle. It didn't happen knowingly by Jesus. In verse 30, Jesus had sensed dunamis, a dunamis, which is the Greek word, which means power or virtue went out of him. Now, it's interesting at this point because here, at this point, we see a comparison between Jesus' humanity and his divinity. Because his divinity said to him, someone has touched you with the touch of faith and they have been healed. But his humanity, Jesus didn't know who it was. And he wanted to turn around and find out who it was that touched him with this touch of faith. And Jesus was quite insistent. He didn't let up because we see in verse 32, he looked around to see who had done this thing. He was focused. He wanted to see who it was that had touched him with this touch of faith that had allowed this virtue to go out from him, which is what the Bible describes it as, that this woman might be healed through her own faith. In verse 33, we see the woman comes forward knowing that she has nowhere else to go. And in verse 33, it says, But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Told him the whole truth. She was sharing with him her testimony. Fearing and trembling, the woman comes forward and throws herself at his feet and tells him the whole truth. In verse 34, Jesus blesses her and sends her on her way. Now, we need to ask an important question just here. Why was it that Jesus was so insistent to find the one who had touched him with the touch of faith? What was it that Jesus was interested in that he would turn around, stop the entire crowd and say, who touched me and keep searching until he found that person who had touched him with the touch of faith? Friends, the key to the answer to this question is found in verse 34. Let us read verse 34. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Jesus was wanted to make sure that he pressed home the point to the entire crowd that was standing by and listening that it was, that it was faith that had healed her, not superstition, not luck, not a doctor's medicine, but Christ pronounced in front of the whole crowd that it was her faith that had healed her. In the Desire of Ages, page 347, we see the spirit of prophecy says this quote, He gave no opportunity for superstition to claim healing virtue for the mere act of touching his garments. It was not through the outward contact with him, but through faith that took hold of his divine power that the cure was wrought. Friends, what lesson is here for us today? What can we learn from this? 
it was the faith of the woman in Jesus that healed her of her issue of blood. And so for every single miracle we see that is of healing in the Bible, Jesus Christ is required on the part of the recipient that the healing might be received. How many people did Jesus say to them, do you believe that I can do this for you? Do you believe? Do you have faith in me? Are you willing to get into the wheelbarrow? Are you willing to act on that which you believe? And for those who said, yes, Lord, we believe, they were healed. They were healed because of their faith in the one who is the great healer. They believed that he could do it. It was not that of the faith itself. The healing for this woman was not in the garment. It was not in any superstition, but it was in her faith in Jesus Christ that she received the blessing of the restoration of her entire life. And I imagine she went on singing her way through the rest of her life, knowing, and that's the sort of episode that could happen in a person's life where they would never forget what Jesus had done for them, how he had recreated, how he had turn their life around. Little wonder that we read in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 these words. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Friends, do we see examples in the Bible of those who believe but still have no faith? There was the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved? So he believed that Jesus was the saviour. And when Jesus told him what he had to do, he turned away sad because he couldn't do those things. He had the faith, but he didn't have the obedience or the belief to put in action as a result of that faith. Morning, wasn't it Jesus himself who says, it wasn't it Jesus himself who said, even the demons believe and tremble, and yet they do not put their faith in action. That man who pushed the wheelbarrow across the tightrope, the promoter stood there and saw him do it and witnessed, but he was not willing to get in the wheelbarrow to go back over. Friends, are we willing to get into the wheelbarrow? And this faith could not be expressed without the testimony of friends and family so faith could spring up in the hearts of those who need healing. Friends, those who have faith, those who do believe, it is our responsibility to express ourselves, to tell people what Christ has done for us, to tell people how wonderful God is, because it is through those words over and over and over from different places that faith springs up in the heart of the unbelievers. And I can tell you honestly, friends, in this time of coronavirus, there are many people asking a lot of questions and they are looking for a hope, they're looking for a faith because they are experiencing fear and anxiety. A few comforting words in an, ear, in, a, in an ear could make an eternity of difference. So I want to challenge you today. I want you to become a part of this gospel cycle. I want you to become a part of this gospel process. In fact, by virtue of the fact that you are here today listening to this sermon, you are already a part. That is why you're here. There is not a single person that is here with us today watching this that is not does that does not have a testimony of some sort of what god has done for them in your own personal story i would hazard a guess that you have had a burden at some point in your life that you have heard the story of the gospel that you have had faith spring up in your heart that you have had an experience with jesus it might be recent it might be a long time ago but at some point in your life you have had an experience with Jesus and that you wish to continue to commit your life to him every single day. Friends, are you willing to get into that wheelbarrow? Are you willing to say, yes, I believe, and put that belief into action? Because for this woman who got down into the dirt and she stretched out her entire life and that whole life was set on that, on that moment when her fingers brushed the hem of Jesus' garment 
and she experienced the joy of that healing in her life, so much so that Jesus could not but turn around and find who it was that in a crowd where he was being jostled left and right and up and down, someone touched him with the touch of faith and he needed to find out who it was to encourage them, to bless them, that the, the crowd could hear her testimony and could continue to be blessed by this story. Friends, I have no, I have um, an idea that this woman has no idea that her experiences that her testimony, that her touch of faith has been written down in a book and has been told over and over and over a thousand times right down to today. She has no idea, but this is the power that a testimony can have. And when you deliver your testimony, when you put your faith into action, when you speak a word of comfort or encouragement in someone's ear, you don't know what effect that is going to have because it may well reverberate right down into the eons of eternity by bringing a life and perhaps many lives to the gospel because you were faithful and you put your faith into action. Friends, I want to pray today that you, for the opportunity to speak to someone else about the gospel. I'm going to pray that that can happen for you. I'm going to pray that God will touch their hearts with your request. I'm going to pray that they might have an experience with God. And I will pray that the Holy Spirit is going to fill them and call them into a saving and living relationship with Jesus Christ. We see the events in the world right now, friends. We have not much time left. Let us learn the lesson from this woman. Let us understand what faith is all about through her humble testimony. And I pray that each one of us will take to our hearts the need, the yearning, the willingness to allow the Holy Spirit to enter into our lives and give us the gift of faith that it might grow and, and sprout up in us for ourselves, for our immediate family and for everybody that we come into contact with. Friends, the touch of faith is a gift that I pray for for you today. And I'd invite you now as we finish in benediction that you will close your eyes and that we'll spend these few moments recommitting our lives to God and calling on him to give us the touch of faith that we might share the gospel to others on his behalf. Friends, let's just bow our heads right now, shall we? Heavenly Father, it is with much pleasure that we come together and we marvel at the wonders of this book that you have given us that is so full of personal testimonies from people who are just ordinary people with ordinary lives, just like we are. And yet we see the power of a personal testimony and the touch of faith that can change lives throughout history and end up bringing multitudes of people to know Jesus, to understand who he is, to love him and to want to serve him, Lord. I pray that each one of us here today will be refreshed and renewed in our belief in Jesus. But as importantly, Lord, we will also be refreshed in our willingness to understand, to love him, to put that belief into action as faith that we might go forward and act on that which we, might, we believe. Lord, I pray that each one of us here today will be willing to get into that wheelbarrow. Heavenly Father, bless us and strengthen us, particularly at this time as we face this coronavirus. I ask that our hearts will be strengthened to ensure that our neighbours and our friends are all cared for, that we will love one another, that we will look after one another as Jesus would have wanted us to, being good Christians. And I would pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will descend upon us and continue to teach us the truth that we know that your coming is very soon and that we might look forward to that day when we will see him in the clouds of heaven and we will hear those wonderful words in our own ears, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Heavenly Father, that this might be the experience of everyone here today. Send us out, Lord, willingly to do your will is my prayer. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen.